Hello, everyone, both on Zoom and in person. Hello. On behalf of the Southeast Asia program, uh, Southeast Asia program at Cornell, I want to welcome you for the Gaddy lecture this evening or this morning for Professor Pujo, Pujo Smitty here. Um, I'm Tamar, a second year PhD student in the Department of Development Studies and a co-chair of the Southeast Asia program. Um, first, I want to thank the Anthropology Department for generously co-sponsoring this event. And I also want to encourage audience members to sign into the clipboard, which I will circulate in a second, um, for funding tracking purposes. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speakers for the evening. We are extremely lucky to have Professors Tanya Lee and Pooja Samedi joining us this evening or morning for Professor Samedi, who is zooming in all the way from Jogjakarta, Indonesia. Tanya Marie Lee is a professor of anthropology at the University of Toronto and has been an influential scholar in the field of development studies and the discipline of anthropology. Over her career, she has focused on culture, economy, environment, and, in, and development in Indonesia's upland regions. She has been the recipient of numerous awards for her scholarship and teaching, including most recently being elected an honorary fellow at the Royal Anthropological Institute in the UK. She has published an outstanding number of articles and books which are so long we won't name here, about the rise of Indonesia's indigenous peoples movement, land reform, rural class formation, and struggles over the forests and conservation. Professor Smidi is an associate professor at the Department of Anthropology at Gajah Mada University in Jakarta, Indonesia. His research addresses environmental and economic dynamics in rural agricultural communities in Indonesia. Specifically by deploying long-term historical ethnographic research, Professor Smidi seeks to understand the social dynamics in Indonesian sea fisheries, plantations, and smallholder communities as they're expected to ex expect expose to external forces and political economic powers. He has, he has published numerous articles in acclaimed journals on fishing communities, upland agricultural communities, and tea and palm oil plantations in Java and Kalimantan. He is the author of Close to the Stone, Far from the Throne, the story of a Javanese fishing community from the 1820s to the 1990s, published by Benang Mera, publisher. Currently, he is studying small, he is studying small holder agriculture producers in Europe, collecting data on the social transformation from agricultural to, to industrial society in southern Germany and Norway in the last century. Professors Lee and Smitty co-authored Plantation's Life, Corporate Occupation in Indonesia's Oil Palm Zone, published by Duke University Press last year which is the topic for tonight's Gaddy lecture. In Plantation Life, Lee and Samidi examine the structure and governance of Indonesia's, Indonesia's contemporary oil palm plantations, which supply over 50% of the world's palm oil. They attend to the exploitive nature of plantation life, wherein the well-being of workers and residents is sacrificed in the name of economic development. It is the Southeast Asia program's honor to host Professor Lee and Samidi tonight here at Cornell. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Okay, so thanks to Mar and uh, James and Tim and all the other organizers who put a lot of work to making this event happen, to getting me here, to getting Pujo online. Um, so Pujo and I have a, a, a routine for doing this when the presentation's in English, I'll give the main presentation, he'll give part of it and be part of the Q&A. Um, the next few weeks, we're, we're doing a book launch of the Indonesian version of our book where it will be reversed. He will be the main speaker and I'll be the backup. Um, so here we go. Um, so what I wanted to do is just start with a few pictures as a way of bringing you into the sights, the sounds, you know, the, the, the kind of space, the kinds of space that we're talking about in this book. And then I will get into some of the main ideas that we're working with. So first of all, this is a product of our um, combined research and our co-authorship. This is what writing together looked like, surrounded by all our field notes coffee, um, a common shared Google Doc, and, you know, sometimes both of us, sometimes one of us with our hands on the keyboard. Um, so early in our collaboration, we, or actually in the process of writing, we asked each other, what is a plantation? And we came up with two different answers. So this is Pujo's version. A plantation is a giant, an inefficient and lazy giant, but still a giant. It takes up space, 
It is greedy and callous. It destroys everything around. It is human, but you cannot form a normal human relationship with it. With it. it can trample you, eat you, or drain your strength and spit you out. It guards its treasure. You cannot tame it or make it go away. You have to live with it, but it's a bit stupid. So if you're clever, you can steal from it. So this is Pujo's kind of attempt to come up with a definition of a plantation. Mine was a bit different. Um, what is a plantation? A plantation is a machine that assembles land, labor, and capital in huge quantities to produce monocrops for a world market. It is intrinsically colonial, based on the assumption that the people on the spot are incapable of efficient production. It takes life under control. Space, time, flora, fauna, water, chemicals, people is owned by a corporation and run by managers along bureaucratic lines. So two scholars, two starting points, one research project. So this uh, image in my mind is one of the most shocking that one could show. These red areas in Indonesia are areas which have already been allocated to plantation concessions um, and, and now amounting to 22 million hectares, one third of Indonesia's farmland. So for anyone who's interested in Indonesia, rural Indonesia, who likes to think of it as a place of you know, diverse agriculture, forest, different kinds of community, look at the extent of the red, right? That is actually the shape of rural Indonesia to come. Um, of this 22 million hectares, about 14 million have been developed. The rest is already under license, which means it's already been rendered precarious or removed from its previous customary landholders, hasn't yet been planted, but will be. So long as the crop continues to be lucrative, over time it will be filled in. So I think to me, this is a very shocking image, right? Because it says we should be paying attention to this because it is radically transforming the character of rural life in a, a fundamentally agrarian society, which is a huge number of people and, and a huge area of land. So um, one third of Indonesia's total agricultural land is currently under corporate concession. That doesn't include all the smallholder oil palm. Um, this is only the plantation portion. What does that look like as a landscape? You know, if land is flat, it's linear, everything is mowed down, completely eradicated, whatever durian trees and coconut trees and rubber groves and rice farms, whatever was there before has gone, um, replaced by a linear grid. If it's hilly, it's been terraced. This is a map from our research area and uh, in West Kalimantan, and the colored blocks represent different plantation corporations. So this is a map that we got hold of from the mid nineties, which showed that by the mid nineties, that's almost 20 years ago, the entire sub-district had already been carved up to five different plantation corporations. Uh, and now, 20 years later, all of this has been built. At the time, only one of these plantations existed, but the rest were already under license. So that's what the, that red means, right? It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's going to be filled in. And then another striking feature of the map is that these colored blocks of plantation concessions take up really all the space. The white areas here, you can see from the, uh, from the lines is hilly. Um, that's the headwaters, right? Places which aren't actually uh, farmable. So all of the potentially arable land in this sub-district has been allocated. And for the local Malay and Dayak population, the only places they can farm are these tiny little residual areas along the banks of the river, little nooks and crannies in between. But basically it's saturation. That's what the red actually means. This is what it means then to live in such a place. So this is an enclaved population. This is a, actually a Malay hamlet. And uh, as you can see, the oil palm comes right down to their kitchen doors. They've been left with no land at all, but they're just perched on the edge of the river, um, surrounded by um, corporate oil palm. That is the fate of the people who live in these nooks and cranny spaces. Um, not everyone um, suffers in the same way. The picture at the top here shows a, a local family that had prospered through this oil palm. They were 
able to set themselves up with a trucking business, supplying um, transportation to the companies and to smallholders as well. The bottom picture uh, is a Malay family that's more or less destitute, um, you know, with no residual farmland and also not necessarily any work. Um, these are workers housing. The workers in the plantation zone are mainly migrants uh, from Java, from NTB, and uh, from some other places. Um, the woman in the top picture is a local Malay woman who lives in one of those tiny enclaves, now the kind of new landless people, who does um, day labor, outsourced day labor without any formal, um, not covered by formal labor law, but women from these enclaves do most of the maintenance work, which involves all the chemical stuff, spreading the herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, and so on. And the young man in the right is a migrant worker who is harvesting the palm. And that's the activity for which the corporations do prefer migrants because they say they are more diligent and more consistent. Um, not surprisingly, the local population, um, you know, granny dies, there's a funeral, you know, things happen, which may mean that someone isn't always showing up for work. Whereas the migrants are there for only one thing, to maximize their earnings and to remit as much money as they can to their families in their place of origin. And so they are, of course, a more consistent labor force. Um, this is a, a picture of the smallholders. Um, so these plantation schemes sometimes come with attached to them uh, an area of land laid out in exactly the same way on the same grid, looks identical to the main plantation but it's handed out to families in lots of two hectares. Uh, each family is supposed to manage their own plot and bring the, the harvested palm to the roadside to be weighed and transported to the factory. So they're part and parcel really of the plantation landscape. And most of them, or many of them are transmigrants. So they come from elsewhere as well. Um, and this kind of contract farming is quite different from when the local farmers decide to plant some oil palm on their own farms alongside their other crops, you know, rubber, rice, other things that they're growing. These people are really part of the plantation machinery, and we have a chapter in our book describing them, although I'm not going to say too much more about them today. Um, transportation is a big problem. Um, the soil in Kalimantan, actually, the natural soil contains, I'm told, no stones. Um, so it's extremely um, prone to uh, erosion. So uh, ironically, the name of the truck Kupu Kupu, which means butterfly, <laughs> um, is not flying anywhere, but is um, sunk. And this is a very common uh, feature of, of plantation roads. They're often, they often look like this. This is the mill. So the, the freshly harvested fruit goes to a mill like this. I think of this picture in terms of kind of shock and awe. You know, it's like only a big corporation could build such a huge belching machinery in the middle of the Kalimantan interior to process all this fruit. It's actually a myth because you could have much smaller mills which produce um, from smaller areas. Um, this mill, like many others, was built on a giant scale because of the delusions of grandeur of the plantation owner, but actually it only operated at about one third of its capacity, which is very common. Um, what's all the fuss about? Um, palm oil, 50% of the products in supermarkets in North America, but also in Asia, um, contain palm oil. It's involved in, it's an ingredient in all kinds of junk food, also cosmetics, the detergents, and of course, a biofuel. Its main um, purchaser, though, of Indonesian palm oil, 65% of it is India, where it's imported as an affordable cooking oil. So here you see the rise of an Indian middle class, you know, able to afford more fried food, is producing a demand for an affordable cooking oil, um, and, you know, Indonesia is the one supplying it. So it's a south-south trade, you know, that's the most significant dimension of it. And of course, the market in India is not as um, susceptible to market-driven campaigns around sustainability and so on, because, you know, people want an affordable oil. This, in my mind, is the second most shocking picture after the map with the red. Um, this is a picture that um, showing is also a version of it as the cover of our book. Um, these are oil palms which have been injected with the herbicide Roundup to kill them. Um, when they become too high to be, too tall to be harvested, 
uh, you can see the size of the person. The person in the white is actually Bujo. Um, and you can see they're huge, right? And these things are harvested basically by a man with a very long stick with a knife on the end. Like it's not a high tech industry. Um, it's basically a long stick and a scythe. But when the palms get too tall, um, they become unharvestable, so they're killed off. And the new palms are planted underneath. So Poot is actually standing next to a second generation palm. So in some parts of um, Malaysia in particular, they're now in their third generation of planting again and again on the same spot or you know a meter away so what you have here is once the system is installed it stays right the the infrastructure is there the plantation rows are there and the palms themselves will be replaced like parts of a worn out machine as will the workers you know the workers retire and a new generation comes in but basically this is a an industrial model you know once it's installed it stays and that is what's there and it's also what is coming on that note. Um, so I just wanted to give you that sort of visual starting point so you can see what we're talking about. And now I want to just, you know, talk a little bit about the main ideas that we develop in the book um, to give you a sense of what we're, what we're arguing here, what we found. So um, our goal in, in writing this book was to um, was to write an ethnography. So, you know, both of us are trained in anthropology and our idea is that, um, was that, you know, at least 15 million people in Indonesia are already living what we call a plantation life. Like they're living in those red zones, whether as workers, whether as people in the nooks and crannies between plantations, but basically a new form of life is being installed here. And we ought to be interested in what is that form of life? You know, how do people live um, in a territory which has been occupied by giants, right? They, um, they are there, they're firmly installed, and there really hasn't been a lot of ethnographic work trying to understand the kinds of relations that are installed there. Many um, ethnographers, or many, much research is focused on what's been lost, the diverse ecologies, the, the diverse livelihoods, customary land, you know, there's a lot of discussion of what's been taken away, but we thought we should focus really on what has been put in place, because that's what's going to be there, you know, now and into the future. So 50 million people then living this life, the, giant, the giants are firmly installed and they do all the things that Gujo says they do. Monopolize space, use people's strength and toss them out like old rags. Um, but what kind of life is it when a giant moves in and you have to live with it? So going back to our definitions, I want to first of all pick up on this idea um, that I raised of a plantation being intrinsically colonial. So what do we mean by this? Um, what we mean, you know, following um, the Malaysian historian, Said Hussein Alatas, is that the alibi for the introduction of plantations is the colonial idea that the natives on the spot are incompetent or lazy or uninterested in efficient production. If you did not have this myth, why would you have a plantation, right? You would be working with your local indigenous farmers, providing them with infrastructure, helping them to you know, develop new forms of economy along with the changing times, but you really wouldn't have a plantation, right? The whole logic of a plantation is that nothing useful is going on with these people or this space. Right? They haven't done anything useful here thus far. Therefore, we are licensed to push them out of the way, as Geert said, you know, flick them away like mosquitoes and uh, install something new and modern and wonderful in their place. So we argue that this um, colonial logic is intrinsic to the plantation format, and therefore it's still present today. Every contemporary new plantation li license comes under the same logic that the natives on the spot aren't doing anything useful, therefore a plantation corporation should be invited in to make good use of the land. So in that sense, um, this colonial myth of the lazy native is alive and well, and we argue that it's sort of intrinsic to the plantation format. Without such a narrative, you would not have plantations. A second feature of 
plantations, we argue, is that they are um, race making machines. Now, this is a, an idea which comes from the um, anthropologist uh, Michel of Trio, you know, who, who, who looked at the kind of uh, political technology of plantations. Obviously, the situations that he was describing in the Caribbean are quite different, um, but it seemed to us that there was a lot of truth to this in this sense. Plantations in the landscape that we are describing present themselves as centers of technical expertise, order, productivity, and above all, modernity, right? This is what a plantation is, this modern, rational, efficient, productive <coughs> enterprise. So what they produce then is racial others as their negative image. Like if the plantation is now being produced and is performing itself as a site of modernity, everything else and all the people surround it must be the non-modern, the anti-modern, the, 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 the ones who didn't progress, right? It's, it's producing the native other as its own um, image, both as its alibi for entering the spot, but also as an outcome of plantation operation. So what we found ethnographically is that these plantations construct um, really intense social hierarchies. Um, so that plantation workers, especially permanent workers, uh, actually come bearing the myth of the lazy native. They too are convinced that the reason they are there as migrant workers is because the natives on the spot do nothing useful. And they, they see themselves as infinitely superior to and different from um, the Malayan Dayak populations that surround them. To such an extent that many plantation workers um, who were in this case from Java and who had been in the plantation for 30 years um, said they had never visited the surrounding um, Malayan Dayak areas they saw no purpose to it you know why would you go and spend time with a lot of lazy and backward people like that nothing of any use or value could be learned there right so this kind of racializing logic in which not just the managers of the plantation but the workers themselves came to see themselves as utterly superior to and different from the surrounding population is, is a product of this um, plantation technology. Um, so thinking about these kind of profound separations and hierarchies, um, this is the kind of the idiom of race, but not in a not in the sense of phenotype necessarily, right? And if you think about the work of um, Cedric Robinson, for example, on racial capitalism, you know, the point he was making is that a, a racial racialism doesn't depend on phenotype. It's not to do with how you look, right? It's to do with the construction of a profound difference and separation and hierarchy in which one group sees themselves as utterly superior to another, defined as deficient and fit only for certain kinds of future, right? And so that's really what's happening here, right? It's, it's a kind of a racialism in, in his sense. It's not as something that's kind of inborn, but something which is produced. So obviously this idea of race is not good fit in Indonesia. Puja and I discuss this quite a bit um, because it's not the way that Indonesians usually discuss difference, right? It's more in terms of culture or ethnicity or, um, but there, 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 is, there is an element to it which, which resonated for us with, these, uh, with this idea of plantations as race making machines. So that's one idea we're playing with then. Another one is the idea of corporate occupation, which forms the subtitle of the book. And that again is not something we had started with. We didn't start thinking about that. Um, I remember um, in an early draft of our book, um, you know, we were talking about weapons of the week, about violence. And I, I, I going back to my field notes, in several places in my field notes, I'd written this is a war, this is a war zone. Like these people are at war here. You know, thinking about the relationship between the people in those little enclaves and, and the plantation corporation or even the smallholders in the corporation. And Puja was saying, well, it's not really war. It's not really prang, right? That in Indonesian means like armed conflict. And, and in fact, we've seen no arms. There's no army, there's no arms, there's no overt violence. So what kind of thing is it? And as we thought more about it, we thought, well, actually, Occupation is not, it's, it's a good word of, way of thinking about it, right? Once the giant has moved in, or once your colonial force or your occupying army has taken control over the territory, you don't necessarily need the army and the guards, 
right? You've already installed the occupying force. It's present in the infrastructure. It's present in its monopoly over space. Now the giants have moved in and you have to live with them, right? You cannot make the occupier go away. So you have to adapt to it. You have to somehow find ways to survive. And if you think about other um, ethnographies and studies of life under occupation, you know, an important figure is the collaborator. Right, the intermediary figure who, who mediates between the occupied and the occupier. And of course, the plantation zone is full of collaborators, um, local members of the local population who become what they call company men, you know, who, who advance the company's cause, sometimes advocating on behalf of the people, sometimes on behalf of the company, often two-faced, you never quite know who they are. This is classic of the collaborator role in the situation of occupation, right? Um, so people's kind of dubious loyalties. So in various ways, this idea of occupation seemed to kind of capture what it is to live in one of those red zones, right? You're, you're, you're not living under the presence of an army, but you have been occupied. And then we realized that the, the occupation space, uh, the way this occupation works, um, and the parallel we drew is actually with occupied Palestine in the sense that um, it's uh, not a homogenous occupation of space, right? There's certain zones occupied spatially, others where people are apparently still living their life, but you know cannot take the road or have to pass a checkpoint or don't have a identity paper of the right kind, right? There's 101 ways in which you're still occupied, even though you're nominally independent. So this is actually how the plantation zone works because those people in those little residual hamlets are not under the legal authority of the plantation corporation. The corporation has no responsibility for them at all. They're treated as just like ordinary villagers. But of course, nothing is ordinary about being there perched by on the edge of the river with no land, right? That, that, is, that is occupation actually, right? But there's no legal relationship. So you, you cannot go to the, the company and say, you know, even an occupied pay, under international law, occupied people have rights, right? They're, they're the rights of the occupied, but these people don't have any official designation. So this kind of variegation of space, people being governed under different kinds of formats of occupation seem to us a good way of trying to account for this kind of deep presence, which isn't just contained within the plantation boundaries, but in fact saturates the whole of society, including quite importantly, the way law works and the way that local government works because the um, uh, local officials, in fact officials at all levels are officially tasked with um, assisting the plantation corporations, right? They're supposed to smooth their way and they're, plant, they're appointed to official coordination committees and they're paid, this is not just under the table payment, but their official role. So what the structure does is it makes local officials the officially appointed collaborators of the occupying force. Therefore, there's no way they can act as the defenders of the local population, right? Because they are company men, right? That's their official position. So what this means for, pe for local people is that they can't go to the normal system. Like you, you think you can go to your headman and complain? Like he's being paid by the plantation. You think you can go to the district head? Well, he's being paid, he's on an official team. You know, quite apart from what he's receiving under the table, he's receiving an official payment over the table. You think you can go and complain to the Ministry of Labor or the Department of Labor? They're on these teams too, right? As is lands and environment and everyone else, right? So, you know, you this is how occupation can kind of like saturate the political and bureaucratic system you know, far beyond um, just the material presence of the plantation. And that's the kind of thing that we discovered, you know, and it was actually far more pervasive and insidious, I think, than we had expected. Okay, so um, you cannot move, remove the occupying force, right? You can't make the giants go away. You have to live with them. Um, how do people do that? Well, one way is to kind of find ways to tap into streams of value. So uh, as Pujo said, like, you know, 
the plantation is a giant, but it's a bit stupid. And if you're clever, you can steal from it. Everyone is stealing from it. So we found kind of theft from top to bottom, you know, the managers, the directors, all the plantation workers, the women spreading fertilizer are like hiding some in a bucket in a ditch. Later on, they're going to sell it to the smallholders. One could think about this in terms of kind of weapons of the week, you know, that they are pushing back. But then, you know, the plantation directors also got doing the same thing. And you wouldn't really think, you know, that's not weapons of the week, right? That is theft on a massive scale to such an extent that it's driving the plantation into bankruptcy. And um, the two plantations we studied, one was privately owned and one was state owned. And this was in a period of peak market prices for palm oil. So they should have been doing really well. Both of them were close to bankruptcy. And that was because of this um, extensive network of theft inside and outside. So um, that's how people live with it in part by finding ways to take what they can. Um, but this kind of um, inefficiency is um, rarely called out, I would say, that the, the kind of the self-presentation of the plantation as modern and efficient, as demonstrated in that whopping big mill that I showed you, are performances of authority, modernity, efficiency, productivity, and profit. And not everyone is looking very closely, like scratching behind the surface to see are they actually that efficient? Are they actually that productive? You know, to have a mill working at one third of capacity is a massive waste of resources. And um, what we found, and many other scholars have shown, is that um, smallholders growing uh, oil palm on their own land can do so um, very efficiently. In fact, more efficiently per hectare and also more efficiently per dollar, right, per unit of money, because they don't need to pay for guards and overseers and secretaries and that whole sort of, you know, bureaucratic apparatus is not needed when a farmer is taking care of their own business. So um, where to from here? I'm going to hand over from Pujo, who's going to um, follow up on, on the what else, what next side of things. Over to you, Pujo. Okay, thanks, Tanya, and uh, thanks also for having me in this uh, said, uh, uh, presentation. Okay, uh, Tanya has uh, told you about the uh, negative side, the sad story of uh, of uh, palm oil cultivation plantation in Indonesia, and, uh, and the question for me is: uh, Is there is any hope uh, for for farmers, for smallholders in Indonesia? Uh, can bad palm oil uh, be made good palm oil? Yeah, since from the perspective of the smallholders, yeah, this work, our work shows yes, it can, but in a way different than the one proposed by uh, RSPO on the round table as a conference of palm oil. Since uh, returning to the status quo ante is not an option, a good palm, palm oil can be defined as palm oil that provides maximum benefit for good smallholders and the company. It is difficult, it is almost impossible for uh, Indonesian uh, government and so from the Indonesian smallholders to effect, uh, uh, to drive out the, uh, the giant, the raksaks and the plantation uh, oil companies. So the alternative is to live side by side. Yeah? Data we presented in this work shows that oil palm cultivation is not always to be handled by a plantation corporation whose presence occupies farmers' lands and marginalized farmers into the status of becoming host in uh, one's own uh, villages. There is no technical reason whatsoever that the cultivation of oil palm or other global market crops could not be carried out by smallholders. Just name it, coffee, tobacco, tea, cocoa, they all began as plantation crops and now are cultivated mainly by smallholders. Smallholders with access to proper infrastructure could cultivate palm oil in a much more efficient way. In our research, we found out that uh, in several places, smallholders applaud produce of much uh, higher uh, harvest compared to the plantation, uh, uh, plantation company plots. 
smallers ya yeah, uh, can work uh, what said uh, can cultivate their plot in much more efficient way because they did not steal or corrupt the farm asset. Yeah. The problem with uh, plantation companies in Indonesia is it is uh, infected by uh, by by stealing by theft yeah, from within and from without. Well, among the smallholders, this problem of theft is almost absent. Farmers, smallholders, do not steal their own fertilizer. And if there is no theft of a fertilizer, of working time, of labor switch, palm oil fields are productive. Cultivation by small farmers, smallholders, also save us from the problem of land grabbing that drives people out of their land which raises the problem of landlessness in a region where lands are supposed to be abundant, a process that hurts and injures the local farmers who find that their basic right to live is being taken away by people from somewhere else. As relations between smallholders and farm laborers are not merely controlled by market mechanism, but also by kinship and stable ties of langanan customers, that keep both side to maintain a smooth and socially acceptable manners in treating each other. Cultivation of palm oil by smallholder is more labor friendly. It gives opportunity to the landless farmers to earn good revenue. The word is small farmers, a harvester with five smallholders customers or 10 hectares of palm oil fields can earn money equivalent to one smallholder. In other parts of Kalimantan, smallholders are starting to plant palm oil with other crops in a mixed crop uh, combination in a single plot, continuing their traditional practice of multi-cropping. In this mode of cultivation, the palm oil yield per hectare is of course lower than a monocrop field. But for the smallholders, it is the way that for generation has been proven to be economically safe. Smallholders know monocrops are risky. Yeah. Following a common sense of having an umbrella before it rains, they always mix a crop with other crops. So when the price of a crop goes down, they still have other crops to fall uh, back on. Smallholders allow the growth of secondary industry, even if it is also small scale. Yeah. Groceries, house building, repair shop, trucking business, even banking. West Kalimantan now is a capital exporter to other parts of Indonesia. The saving of smallholders in the credit unions reach amount that no longer can be absorbed by West Kalimantan itself, then it should be sent somewhere else uh, to make uh, the money productive. So is it not better for palm oil to be cultivated by the smallholders and the big corporation handling the oil processing industry? Yeah. Once again, smallholders in our research site state clearly that they are not against uh, palm oil. Palm oil is fine. It is capable of providing them with good revenue. What they are against is plantation corporation that cheated them out of their lands. Perusahaan yang suka ngakal tanah petani. Perusahaan yang mencuri tanah petani. Thank you. You are still mute, uh, Tanya. Great, so um, uh, brief, but the, hopefully giving you sort of a sense of what we are working on and, and what we have written about, um, much more we could say, but uh, I think it would be more interesting to make this a and a So let's just start with people in the room and then we'll, um, how, uh, James, are you gonna handle other questions online or? I can look at the questions. Okay, uh, I mean, I, I'm not seeing a chat. Uh, you want to encourage people, 60 people on Zoom. So I just invite them to put their questions into the chat. I, I, I can help. Okay, okay. Yeah. And um, Pujo, you open the chat, Pujo, so you can uh, see as well and choose the questions that you want to respond to. Great. So any questions first? Yes. I can start. <laughs> um, I, I just want to pick up on what Professor Pujo uh, ended his note with. He said something like um, the small older farmers are not against oil palm, they're mm -hmm. against uh, 
plantation. And that to me is very interesting, um, especially given that oil palm is making its way to certain other places and communities are resisting the entry of oil palm. Um, but to farmers there, it, it, it seemed that they don't, they, they don't mind living with oil palm. And so I, I just want to understand more in terms of how they uh, relate to oil palm um, uh, it, as a plant, as a crop, as, yeah, as co-existing yeah. species, I guess. Yeah. Pujo, do you want to start? Yeah, OK. So yeah, that's correct that uh, the smallholders are not against oil palm as a crop. Yeah? They are against the company who come with the oil palms to their uh, territory. So the relation between uh, the uh, farmers and smallers with oil palm is in the beginning, they uh, cultivated oil palms in as, uh, as uh, uh, contract farmers uh, with the uh, plantation. Yeah. And they have to, uh, uh, or, uh, they have to uh, cultivate the oil palm and then they sold uh, the uh, harvest to the uh, oil palm companies. But uh, they see and uh, they find that the re this relation is not good because and the uh, uh, the relation is uh, the relation is not good and it is uh, it is facilitated by a cooperative which is uh, created by the, uh, by the company and, and the cooperative is also a mechanism to extract money from the farmers and also uh, when the farmers join this uh, uh, relation with the uh, companies they had to. Uh, give up uh, 7.5 uh, hectares of their land and only one third of that land is written to them, was written to them. So they lost uh, two thirds of uh, their lands in the company. The uh, mode that farmers uh, that smallholders uh, prefer is to uh, start their own palm oil uh, fields and they sell it to the free market. So they will not get, I would say, any trouble with uh, palm uh, with the plantation companies who like to uh, to buy their uh, uh, harvest cheap and so on and so forth. So they would like to uh, to uh, cultivate uh, the oil palm as a free farmers, not as farmers uh, 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 in a contract relation in a uh, in contract relation with a company. But uh, the problem in Kalimantan is a big uh, 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 refinery for oil palm is controlled is owned by the plantation companies. So an alternative, the alternative is let's the farmers uh, build a start a cooperation or collaboration or association to uh, establish their oil uh, their, their oil palm processing. It will be good for them. Over to you, Tanya. <laughs> right. Yeah, so one chapter of the book, we look at this kind of position of the tide of farmers and their farmers describe it as, as being made into the stepchildren of the plantation. It's like they're part of it, but they're the remaindered part. They feel that the deal that's struck over land and so on is very unfavorable to them. So they see no benefit to it. Who wants to be tied to a giant that treats you unfairly? And, you know, Pooja's comment, like, you know, it's human, but you can't form a normal human relationship with it, it's very important to them because with their rubber traders in the past, you can form a human relationship with your rubber trader, right? And if your trader treats you unfairly, you can also switch to a different rubber trader, right? And you know their families and their children and your kids go to the same school, right? I mean, you they, are, they have a role in the system as traders, but they are fully human and you can form a human relationship with them and there is therefore some social control. Right, both competition and social control. A corporation, on the other hand, it seems to be full of people, but you can't talk to anybody who makes any sense. And then people are rotated, and then there's a new person in charge. And you cut a deal with a manager, and you thought you'd formed a relationship, and then and then they're transferred somewhere else, and it's a new guy who, and you, you know, it does. You can't actually form a human relationship of trust and any kind of equality with a giant. Right. So um, for, for many reasons, um, they don't for correct reasons, they don't trust the corporations um, and but they they are quite comfortable with their traditional system of traders. So there's that <clears throat> the companies will respond well, but, you know, small the problem with the issue is infrastructure and milling, because those are the, 
as I, as I mentioned, the technology is extremely basic, like a man with a stick, like it, it's not as if these plantations have been innovating, right? They're using now the same technology they did a century ago, and it's the same one the smallholders use. Like they're carrying their, the fruit on their backs in a basket, just like the diets do, right? It's the same thing. So um, it's it's not, there's no technological, there's no technical efficiency of scale, basically, um, in this crop. The only issue is the transportation and marketing. Now, if one had a smallholder-based agricultural policy, you could solve these problems, right? There's other ways of organizing transportation and marketing, as Kujo mentioned. Take the example of Thailand. Thailand is the world's third largest producer of oil palm, of palm oil after Indonesia and Malaysia, and they have no plantations. It's all smallholder based. Thailand also, interestingly, was never directly colonized and doesn't have a myth of the lazy native. Actually trusts its smallholders to do farming in the normal way, and, um, and they've been very successful in this. Uh, it's not to say it's perfect. There's problems in Thailand too. And smallholder there doesn't always mean like super small. Like some of these are like 80, 100 hectares, which in our definition would already be a small plantation. Nevertheless, it's not a giant that's occupying 50,000 hectares back to back, right? All that red, you know, on that map, which is in my view, so deeply disturbing as a form of life into the future. So there are other ways of doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, you asked also about the relationship with the crop. People know it as a very productive crop. As they say, uh, if you have six hectares of oil palm, you can send your children to the university. Like two hectares feeds the farm, you know, your production costs. Two hectares feeds the family. And two hectares is your investment fund to buy additional land for your children as they marry or to educate your children or some of them who will go on to non-farming futures as one would hope, you know. Um, and with eight hectares, you can send several children to the university. So they that's their relationship to it is that it's a highly lucrative crop, which gives them the possibility of living well and a modern life and a good standard of living and educated children and many things that they aspire to. But if you are squeezed into a little nook and cranny because the corporation's got all the land, imagine how infuriating that is, right? You look on and you see other people prosper and you want into this, but not in the way that's actually has been offered. Yeah. Other okay. questions? Next question from uh, Andre Octaviandra, Tanya. Okay. Is, uh, yeah. Uh, she observed that there is a 10 years, can be a 10 years time uh, of gap between land clearing and the actual planting of oil palm. What's going on? What's happened in the field uh, in relation to this uh, fact? Uh, should I answer first? Sure. Okay. So uh, there is a problem, not a problem, there is a technical uh, matter in uh, opening up a uh, large scale palm oil that you need to obtain a permit from the local government. Yeah? And this, uh, this, it is not. Uh, you can say it is easy. It cannot. Uh, it also can uh, be difficult to obtain this uh, and this permit because it involves large sums of money, and it is a field of corruption. So I think this uh, ten years gap is the time. Uh, it is. It can be. Uh, what's it? Arena of bargaining. Whether they are willing to. Uh, what's it? Uh, the, the company willing to pay a high bribe and. And whether the uh, local governments uh, was it willing to accept uh, the uh, money offered, or they just beginning, and it can take uh, ten years. That's my guess, yeah, because I don't have uh, the data uh, direct information on this. And do you have any? Uh, do we have any uh, plan uh, uh, conduct uh, more research in the future? Yes, my agenda right now is to to uh, to conduct research on the topic of mixed crop oil palm. Is the mixed crop idea of uh, oil palm is a wish? thinking or realistic solution for this problem yeah uh, but uh, the, the research is still going on uh, i involve uh, uh, more uh, uh, student uh, student in this project over to you Daniel. okay this is actually something that Pooja and i haven't quite agreed on because from what i've seen um the way people handle the oil palm is that if they have access to a road they want to monocrop it put all their oil palm near the road because the road needs the transportation and so you put your other crops like your rubber and your rice a bit further away so it's still a mixed farm but it's not a mixed plot i get the level of the plot like your roadside plots are going to be all oil palm but you go 
one kilometer in land too far to carry the stuff. It's extremely heavy. Right? That's where you'll see the other elements of the farming mosaic. So yes, mixed farming, but Pujo is actually interested in mixed pots, right? Which was has been done with rubber and other crops. So I'm very interested to see what he finds. So this other issue of the delay is that the initial license is um, even after it's been issued by the government, the companies then have to go and get the land released by the people. And of course they waive the license and they say, the government is giving us this license, you have to agree. So there's a, there's a, a paradox there. Like how could the government have given the license to something and I still have to agree as if I was the owner and actually had the right to say no. And it's very ambiguous in Indonesian law and practice. So um, what, the, what the license holder has to do then is then to go to the intended site and try to get the people to sign a land release. And they do this by sending their agents a couple of years ahead, basically to identify local leaders, charismatic people, customary leaders and so on, and effectively make them into company men. Um, and then they become the ones who will persuade their neighbors and kin to sign in. So there is a process which is called land release or freeing land from Beba Santana, which can take some time. And that's only after they've actually got hold of the land and started to plant, can they get the final part of the license, which is the concession, the Hagebu. So that's another reason for delay. Sometimes they, the local people are resistant and uh, often push back. And sometimes uh, it fails. Right? The company is not able to actually realize its nominal license. But what we have found, and other people have written about this, John McCarthy and others, once the initial license has been issued, it acts like a sort of palimpsest. It, it, it's still there, even if the plantation hasn't yet happened. And so it will be sold to another company and another company. And five years later, Someone will come waving a license saying, you know, we bought this license, we are going to develop now. So that's why the red in that picture alarms me so much, because even though not all of them are yet operationalized concessions, they all have this preliminary license, which means that eventually, even if there's some pushback and it takes some time and some people are resistant, you know, eventually the old leaders die and the resistant ones get tired and then it will happen. And that's been the history of it. Most communities actually initially resist. And in most places, it eventually happens. So that's, this is like, there's, a, there's a nutrition element. Okay, are there questions? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you so much for that talk. I haven't read your book, but I'm looking forward to reading it now. Um, so I have two questions um, sort of unrelated to each other, but the first one is I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about your methods. You sort of said that you're doing an ethnography, but to me, you're also doing this sort of very deep um, reconstruction of the economy out of the plantation. So, how you could speak a little bit about sort of how you did that ethnographically as an anthropologist. And then the second question is sort of how do, again, we're to the economics of how, how are the corporations as a sort of amorphous, I understand, entity of humans conceiving of what you're essentially presenting as an economic failure. How do they see themselves sort of too big to fail? And sort of why continue expanding if it's actually not as effective? Right. <clears throat> Great. Um, Pucha, do you, do you want to talk about the method part for status? Did you, could, could you hear the question or not very well? Not, not very well, but it is about the, uh, about the method, right? Um, sort of how, how we went about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we went to the field together with uh, with uh, with uh, many students, with a lot of students. Yeah. So we asked our students, yeah, and that's and that's what we did. So uh, we went there, but we have our uh, we had our own research agenda, Tanya and me, and then we also give students a task that is to collect in, uh, ethnographic data in certain uh, villages with a, uh, with a clear structure what kind of data and they should collect on what they, what is the theme of their uh, their research and they. And they present, they said they written uh, field notes, and then uh, we pull our field notes together and give the access to everyone who contributed to the field notes. And then uh, it is up to us how to use uh, the field notes, whether to uh, write uh, uh, the student thesis or to write our articles and this book. So that is the method. 
and uh, we divide our team into two areas, uh, into three areas. That is the areas of the uh, state palm oil companies, and then the areas of uh, private palm oil uh, companies, and then the area with uh, we said in the fringe, in the outside the border of the uh, of the uh, of the plantation. So we divided our research area into three zones, and uh, I think in that uh, that uh, division uh, uh, country. I would say a uh, clear picture of what's going on in this uh, palm oil area for us. Over to you, Tanya. Right. So, you know, it's, we, we tried to cover the whole plantation zone rather than just inside one plantation. So two plantations of different types, the interstitial spaces, the upriver places, spaces, the smallholders. So it was good for a team project. Pujo has a had an endlessly expanding field school. Initially, <laughs> there were going to be, I think, 10 Indonesian students and 20 uh, 10 Canadian students and 20 uh, of his, uh, his students from his university. His 20 became about 100 last time I looked. It kept on expanding because um, it was a great opportunity for these students. Pujo has a history of running field schools for his anthropology students in Java, but usually don't have funding to go elsewhere. So they'd be mostly limited to studies in Java. So this was the chance to go to Kalimantan. It was a big adventure and I'd have to say for many of these students from Java who are also kind of urban middle class um it was uh as foreign as for the Canadians right they felt they were going um into a very strange land and in fact for many of them it was disappointing they thought they went were going up a river in Kalimantan and it would be indigenous people and forests and you know, exotic things. And in fact, it's logging, mining, plantations. It's an industrial zone and it's a pretty ruined landscape in many ways. Um, so it was a disappointment from their kind of, you know, their own Orientalist fantasies, I would say. <clears throat> but never so divided the labor, but you, the distinction you were making was between ethnography and economy. So, I mean, both Pujo and I are kind of economic anthropologists, right? So we wouldn't really just, divide it that way we would you know for us the economy is a field of, of, of ethnography right we try to understand um how people construct their livelihoods their value you know what what, what they can sue how they involved in relations with employers with their neighbors like the whole field of kind of economic and political relations was part of what we studied so I, we wouldn't really distinguish it that way. But one thing we did try to do was just, you know, in our initial mapping was to recognize that a plantation zone has many different kinds of people. And so we had to, we wanted to cover that. And of course we could take advantage of the, of the team. So for example, plantation, migrant plantation workers are mostly young men. Middle-aged female professor can't really go and hang out that easily with young men in the barracks at night, right? I mean, lots of things were not gonna happen, but the young male Javanese students could be precisely there, you know, with uh, other young male Javanese people. It was great, right? Um, some of the women from uh, Pujo's students um, became very close to the women office workers and sort of studied the, the life of a secretary in a plantation. You know, these are all part of this machinery and by 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 drawing the students into the work they were able to get close to different kinds of people one of the students one of my students from Canada is a German fellow um for the Canadians there Indonesian wasn't that great they did a little bit but he he basically rode the trucks for a month he rode the trucks alongside the drivers picking up that fruit getting sunk in those holes looking you know at the transactions at the site where the palm is uh, the fruit is offloaded and money is changing hands because the drivers want to get ahead of the queue and their smallholders don't want their fruit to be it's all kinds of stuff you can observe by trucking around with truckers for a month right so there was ways in which they could use their skills as observers even though their linguistic skills were more limited so that was that was how we went about it you're asking the question of like, why do they proceed if it's not necessarily profitable? So this is something Pujo, I don't know if you Pujo heard that story, you might want to add after this Pujo, but uh, something Pujo studied in Java, right? How come the tea plantation that he studied historically, according to, if I guess correctly, Pujo, in more than a hundred years has never made a profit. And yet it is still there, right? Because 
someone bails it out, right? A, a, a bank sort of invests again. And so to really account for this, you have to, um, in our analysis, you have to kind of follow the money because profit is only one part of the money, right? There's all the money that leaks left and right. You know, it's a giant, you can steal from it. You might eventually kill the giant if you steal too much, right? But most people have an interest in not killing the goose that leads, that lays the golden eggs, right? So this leakage of money is actually a way of sustaining the plantation because a lot of people now have an interest in this thing still being here, uh, laying golden eggs on which we too might get a little share. So following the money, understanding this theft as actually productive of a certain kind of complicity, um, very many people acquiring this interest. And then Pooja's already mentioned like the money and the licensing, there's lots of reasons why government officials or even bank managers would approve loans because there's money in it. So you, the, the, one of the analytical frameworks we use, uh, I think we call it regimes of extraction, not one. Is, is multiple, right? There's the extraction of profit, which is the kind of the more obvious kosher one, right? But then there's all these other kinds of regimes of extraction, which also account for the longevity of this form. Do you want to add something, Fisher? Uh, not for all this part, no. but there's okay. still a question on the racial, uh, racial okay. making of plantation. And uh, should I start? Yes, go for it. Okay, so uh, this is about uh, race uh, relation in Kalimantan. People in Kalimantan aware of the presence of people from other area of other tribe and then they present the thing uh, on the uh, face of a uh, tribe of other uh, people from other areas. And they realize there are Chinese uh, community and there are also Japanese community. They've been in Kalimantan since uh, since in the beginning of yeah since the beginning of history. But uh, before the arrival of the plantation, the relation between this uh, inter-ethnic group, inter interracial group is, yeah, is, is, is okay, it's equivalent. People make jokes, people realize the presence of the other, but they take their presence as, as equal. The joke among the Daya and also the Malays and the Java in uh, Java in uh, Kalimantan is uh, Daya tukang canggul, Jawa tukang pikul, Cina tukang kumpul. That is the daya works on the field, and then uh, the uh, uh, the Japanese work as a transporter, and the Ch uh, Chinese work as a trader, and that's okay. And they make joke among themselves. But uh, after the arrival of the plantation, this uh, racial uh, racial relation becoming uh, becoming what you say? It's becoming a tools to mechanism to create profit, yeah, to create uh, uh, difference. That uh, in the plantation uh, structure, for instance, that the plantation company prefer to uh, to hire uh, workers from Java and other islands, not from the locals, uh, from from not from uh, from the uh, village around, uh, around the plantation, on the basis that uh, on the argument that people from local that the locals are troublemakers. Yeah, it is easier to uh, to uh, to subdue and to control people from outside Kalimantan rather to control people from the Kalimantan itself. So this uh, after the arrival of the plantation, this um, uh, racial relation becoming uh, uh, becoming troublesome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Silakan Dania. Right. So um, I'm just following a few of the questions here, which. Um, which relate to this topic. Um, so one question is, um, who are the non-locals brought in to work on the plantations? Where are they from? So on the state plantation we studied, they were mainly uh, Javanese with the main field workers, um, Bataks more often as managers. The colonial history of plantations in Sumatra meant that you know it was a prestigious occupation for young uh, Sumatrans, especially Bataks, to go to the plantation professional training school and get training in management. Um, so they came from different places. On the private plantation, um, they were many of them were from NTB. Um, so this is a very arid area. A lot of people, it's hard life, um, very limited available land. But basically these plantations can 
recruit from a massive labor reserve right across Indonesia. And in these days of mobile phones and easier transportation, um, you know, people come from all over. The private plantation didn't do too much about recruiting, but groups of laborers would arrive with a broker and the broker would effectively sell them, you know, sort of say, here, I brought you 20 people. Do you want them? And the, the price is you've got to reimburse their travel costs and I, the broker also need my cut. And, and then, you know, they're ready to work for here. The people, though, did not see this as a form of bondage for them. The fact that you have to pay for travel costs and this may involve a debt is quite normal. It's like cost of doing business. Um, but the, the migrant workers, you know, see themselves actually as, as entrepreneurs. You know, it's like they, they see themselves as taking an initiative to travel far away and try to improve their situation. So um, idioms of kind of entrapment and, and bondage, bonded labor and so on, don't really fit with the contemporary plantation in Indonesia. It's actually the opposite problem. It's more one of outsourcing. It's not that the plantations want to capture people. It's that they don't want to take responsibility for captured people, or in fact, for any people. So they prefer outsourced, casual, short-term and contract because then they can throw them out by the day or the week or the month or the year, they don't have to be responsible for health plans and pension plans and everything long term. So it's actually the opposite of labor bonding. It's more um, casualization in the plantation economy as in other parts of the economy. So, you know, the same technology, the plantation technology can be used to kind of entrap, but it can also be used in the opposite way. Um, so another question asked here is the difference between the state and the, and, the, and the private. So that was one difference. The state plantation we studied was started in 1980, and it was a sort of high new order um, Suharto period. And uh, it was understood to be um, a kind of icon of modernity. You know, here workers would have proper housing and proper childcare. Both women and men would be employed. There was schooling, there was a food ration. And these were in fact, very good jobs. And the Javanese um, who were recruited to these jobs, most of them stayed for 30 years until they retired. And you know, talking to them about their own histories, and, oh, I was a street seller, I was a construction worker, or I sold um, ice. And you know, these were urban lumpens mainly, you know, people who had no land and for whom this kind of secure job with pay and, and pay and benefits was actually a good job and they stayed. And the women were also given proper employment, the same as their husbands with pay and pensions and the whole lot. So these were kind of little islands of modernity, which were understood as sort of demonstrations, right? Um, the irony was that they didn't really demonstrate anything to the local Malays and Dias because they had no access to this. You could see how the plantation workers lived in their neat little houses and you could want your children to go to school just like they did but you actually had no access because you didn't have access to those jobs and you were just you know stuck in a little enclave perched on the river right so it was a kind of you know if one thinks about this as a kind of a modernity project bringing modernity to the interior of Kalimantan it brought it there in this little island space of the plantation, but it didn't make it available to the population at large. They, in fact, their chances were reduced because they, they ended up landless. The private plantation operated a bit differently, um, recruited in a more casual way, a combination of, of uh, short-term and contract workers, um, had a more diverse workforce, um, but other elements were similar, yeah. Um, you Another question here is um, whether this kind of, uh, did they know, this is a question from uh, Adam. Um, the neo-colonial architecture of the cult palm oil cultivation accidental or by design? Did the company go into these operations with the expectation that the racialization and other ramifications would occur or did it just happen? So this is an interesting question because the, um, the, the um, Batak plantation managers um, who were trained in this plantation training school in Sumatra carried with them 
one could say colonial attitudes, you know, they too thought they were going out to the wild frontier to, you know, bring modernity where it was lacking. And um, some of them actually, uh, plantation workers told us that, that, that they would never dare stand in the presence of a manager, like they would crouch or sit on the floor. So, you know, embodied practices of extreme hierarchy, which in colonial times, Times one would have thought about as you know, white, you know, Dutch plantation manager, brown worker, but these were all Indonesians, and this is the modern era. We're talking about the 1980s, but nevertheless, um, as one worker said to us, like the old manager, he had a lot of the colonial in him, and um, and he said, and we were trained that it shouldn't be like that. This is the modern era, and we should be more professional and more modern, and we should run things in a kind of you know, a family way. But as you know, idioms of family in Indonesia are also profoundly hierarchical. The family is run by the father, right? Who dictates uh, what should be done by the family members. So it was still hierarchical, you know, slightly different idiom. But I, I don't think anyone, the way the managers saw their role was not as replications of a colonial racial hierarchy, but as professionals running a plantation, right? Their self-identity is very much as professionals and managers. Pujo, you want to add something? Not really. Next question. <laughs> there, is a, there is a question that is from Richard Porsuk that is uh, uh, a situation uh, among uh, the plantation workers uh, after uh, the uh, Suarto period, in, in the post-Suarto period, is their situation got uh, worse or getting better? And also it's related to the question of if reformasi is a neoliberal decentralization, uh, does it has any impact uh, what's it, uh, to, the, uh, to the situation in plantation? Okay, I'll start. I'll start, uh, I'll start uh, with the last question. What, uh, what does the effect of decentralization uh, uh, to the life in plantation Indonesia? The decentralization of power in Indonesia, uh, okay. Yeah, it also decentralized the right to corrupt. So that's what happened in plantation uh, during the Suarez time. The uh, Suarez time, if you uh, people, if uh, an, an entrepreneur would like to open plantation, they have to get a permit from the central government in Jakarta. But not that, uh, after the reformation, the permit uh, can be obtained from the local uh, government, from the uh, head of the regency. And it become a field of a uh, source of 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 uh, levies, uh, um, uh, levies uh, illegal income from the uh, region from the local uh, governments because they can extract money. Was it? I mean, they can sell a permit as uh, was it, as much as they uh, uh, as much as they can uh, to get a uh, cash to uh, to uh, was it, to finance their election and also to enrich themselves. So one of one uh, impact of this uh, reformasi of decentralization of power in Indonesia is the decentralization of right to corrupt. You know, to mm. put it uh, to, to put it bluntly. And now, how about the situation of labor in the post Suharto time? That is during the Suharto uh, during the uh, Suharto time, and especially in the uh, state plantation. The state plantation is uh, was uh, used as a center of modernization as a uh, as uh, what's it, uh, as a model of modernization, the workers were uh, were uh, yeah well uh, well uh, well uh, well taken care. But uh, after the reformasi with the neoliberal uh, neoliberalization of Indonesian economy, the uh, state plantation is also was also neoliberalized, and then uh, the the director the managers become more profit oriented, and they are not always, uh, they are willing to sacrifice in the uh, in the interest of the workers. For the sake of making profit for the uh, for the uh, companies, or or uh, for the was it uh, uh, to make a money for themselves, that is the the was it the, the, the situation during uh, between the two periods. Silakan Tania. Yeah, it's not it's not a very edifying story, is it? Um, I see another specific thing was the two thousand and three labor law, which um, kind of enabled some of this outsourcing and casualization legalized it so for particularly for women workers um their situation has become much more precarious for young workers 
they no longer can expect to have lifelong employment, but they're on a two year contract, which doesn't include housing for their families. You know, it's it's gotten much tougher for workers. And that's that's deliberate. That's a feature of the law, which was intended to promote investment. And as you know, last year, Indonesia passed another law called, in my view, really scandalously, but um, the law to create jobs. Um, the omnibus law to create jobs, which was a massive um, attack on all protective land, labor, and environmental laws, reducing protections in every field in the name of attracting more foreign investment and creating more jobs, right? So the, the direction is one in which the conditions um, around land acquisition, environmental standards, labor standards is, is deteriorating significantly in this in this way yeah go ahead yeah you you, you uh, yes uh, yeah, i was wondering uh, because in blurb uh, with the book um, you all mentioned that um this kind of colonial style relations of the plantation uh undermines citizenship or the close citizenship yes i was wondering uh, whether the local understanding or idioms of talking about citizenship is maybe in relation to the state was it because of the racialization of the plantation right right uh, there are certain terms of relations in relation to those not yeah. assuming the failure and so on right so um it, it that's a hard thing to kind of put in a very short form and i'm not sure if the blurb did justice to it but um Basically, what, what, what we were arguing, and I, I described it earlier in terms of the role of kind of government officials and leaders and the role of law. So if you think about, you know, a citizen on the one hand being kind of, you know, governed by the rule of law, like we show how law really doesn't work in the plantation zone. Labor law, land law, environmental law, like none of it actually applies, right? So there's that problem, you know, you're not defended by the rule of law. But there's a second problem, which, um, you know, Pujo and some others have, have studied as a group in the Netherlands, which has been looking at kind of everyday citizenship in Indonesia. And one of its characteristics is that um, as, a, as a, what Indonesians call in the kind of class idiom, a small person, you know, or in Kachil, right, you would never go to approach a site of authority on your own as an equal citizen or in terms of your rights. You would go accompanied by an intermediary who is understood to be, you know, uh, whose job it is to kind of defend small people and, you know, make your case. So that's how everyday citizenship works, right? Um, so it, it, it is already profoundly hierarchical within the idiom of equal citizenship, like, you can't just go to an office and say, I demand my labor rights, you know, they, and, and the worker said this, he said, first of all, we don't know where the office is. And secondly, if we went there, we don't know anyone, right? So for them to go somewhere without an intermediary, was just totally pointless. And thirdly, he said, well, we know for sure they would side with the plantation. They would never listen to us because we're just orange and chill, like we're nobody's here, right? They would side with the big people because they too are big people, right? So this kind of, the, the local idiom is a class idiom, you know, in terms of kind of little people, big people, make to them a, a total absurdity, the idea that you could go and demand your rights or make a claim. So where the plantation comes in here, I mean, that's routine, right, across Indonesia, but where the plantation comes in is by eroding the intermediary relationships, because all of the people whose job it is actually to mediate for you, like your customary chief, your kapala ada, your village headman, all of them are officially collaborating with the occupying force. So you've lost your intermediaries. So that's the kind of specific way in which citizenship is eroded. So you're still nominally an equal citizen before the law, but in practice, you are um, defenseless, you know, whatever grievances you have. And people actually said this to us. They said, yeah, well, who are we gonna go and complain to? Like, you know, this, what's happening to us here is, is appalling, but no one listens to us. Where could we go? Who, 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 what is the proper procedure here for lodging a complaint? You know, they, 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 they were baffled by this problem. And I, and I do think it's quite specific to Indonesia. I and mean, some of you here, I think, work in India, and, and it's quite different the way in which both NGOs operate as intermediaries, 
but also the way in which people, even poor people, do understand that they have legal rights, uh, which they expect to be defended. And I think that that's actually not so obvious in Indonesia, in my view. Do you want to ask something, Pujar? No, thanks. That's enough, I think. That's clear enough. Very much. Both of us trying to kind of fathom out what's wrong with this place? You know, like why, you know, one of the idioms we played with as, as we started writing, writing is we, we both came up with this idea. Do you remember this, Pujo? Like, like a sense of unease. It's like something in this place, it feels off. Everything is off kilter. Relationships are not normal. You know, the way people treat each other. Like there's no, there's conflicts and there's no mediation. You can't, even the, like, the customary dispute system was in disrepair because the customary chiefs were all working for the plantation. So they were factionated, right? Like everything felt off kilter. And so we, we, we initially our chapter was called a, <clears throat> a feeling of unease. And I'm like, well, that's too vague. Like, you know, uneasy about what? What does it to be uneasy? So it forced us to kind of try to dig deeper to figure out yeah, well, why is this place so unstable, so off kilter? Why is everybody feeling out of sync here? And occupation was the idea that we came up with, because basically you're living under occupation. So institutions have been altered, right? Not officially, but in fact, the normal village institutions do not work here, right? You are an occupied population and therefore things are going to be different. Yes. Yeah, so uh, follow up on the question of relationship and institution, and Roderick has. What is it very peculiar about cooperative? In Indonesia, that instead of bringing welfare to its members, actually create a system that is disciplining also mm. the cooperation its members. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to speak to that, Bajo? I, I don't know if you, can, you can't really it. hear it. So the question mm -hmm. was: um, many people place their hope or faith in co-ops, but what we show, at least in our study, is that co-ops are um, highly compromised. Kind of organization and they don't they don't do the job of you know so can you explain a bit more like why that happens and is it unique to the plantation zone or is this a problem with co-ops throughout indonesia actually no it is a problem with uh with uh, co-ops throughout indonesia it was introduced to indonesia in 1910s in the i would say after the <laughs> ethical policy during the colonial time as a kind of solution to bridge uh, to develop the uh, native economics and the, the smallholders, farmers, and uh, villagers' economy. But now, what really happened? It uh, it uh, it doesn't work. It never works. Uh, every cooperative in Indonesia become uh, become an arena for the elite, local elites, to uh, to uh, to promote their own interest in the name of the uh, society and. Uh, it, it is uh, it is the case like that yeah uh, outside the plantation and also uh, and also in the plantation in the plantation the situation is, is worse because the cooperative is not uh, established on the initiative of the smallholders it is established on the initiative uh, of of the uh, plantation companies and it was established as a tool for the companies to deliver the to deliver the uh, the uh, the payment of the harvest it is not a trading cooperative, uh, was it uh, in the sense of uh, created by the farmers or uh, run by the farmers for the benefit of the farmers. It was in the organ of the uh, plantation for the benefit of the plantation. And uh, it was uh, appropriate uh, by uh, the local elites to become their arena and their tools to get closer to the uh, plantation companies and also to extort, uh, was it, to extort their uh, fellow farmers. Over to you, Tanya. Yeah, I mean, there's inter if you're interested in this topic, there's a very nice essay called uh, Custom and Corporacy by um, historian, ah, blanking on his name. Sorry, looking back to me in a moment. Um, it's cited in the book anyway, but um, you know, many historians have studied, oh, historians have also studied this now, right? This kind of idea that Indonesians are kind of 
naturally cooperative people and kind of inclined to collectivism. And this is um, really a colonial era myth. Like if, it, if, if the Western is, is a racialized myth, if Westerners are individualist, then Easterners must be collectivist, right? Like the, Im the image of the harmonious village, you know, the kind of naturally communitarian. So it's not to say that there aren't specific practices in which Indonesian people cooperate, right? And the, the most obvious ones are things like house building and weddings, you know, when people do rally around and help with labor and goods and so on. So it's not that there's never any cooperation, but sustained economic cooperation, um, like you see often in Latin America, where you know peasant groups really do spontaneously form cooperatives for production and trade. I mean, it's not that it can never happen, but there's actually no history of it ever happening in Indonesia. The only co-ops which have ever existed have been instituted by the government, always in the name of the kind of natural inclinations of the Indonesian people, but it is a myth. And they've, as Puja said, they've always been vehicles for um, monopsony. Basically, they become um they you have to self through them they're able to impose a kind of a monopoly and and extract all kinds of rent as a result um it's not to say one couldn't develop different kinds of cooperatives but you would be kind of starting from scratch you couldn't just assume that this was the natural inclination of the people which required only to be systematized what people actually do is vastly distrust each other on the economic front um, and they're more likely to entrust their traders who over whom they can exercise some social control, especially when the traders are not monopolists. Like if there's half a dozen, it's great, right? Because the, the guy who treats you fairly, that's where everybody goes, right? So, so they, they, they have, they, 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 collective action is not easy. Whereas an individual relation, a dyadic relationship with the trader is something more manageable. And that's actually the one which spontaneously arises not a collective. So I think we're running out of time and we should stop, right? Because I feel, you know, there's still um, 40 wonderful, brave people online. And so I'm sorry we haven't got to see your faces, but thank you all for attending and for sticking with this. I hope it's been interesting and useful. Um, thank you to this wonderful audience. Okay. So, um, good night, Pujo. <laughs> okay. Thank you for attending this meeting. And also thanks for the uh, question. Uh, that is, uh, I really uh, appreciate it. And then, yeah, I'll use uh, the comment and question for my next uh, research on uh, palm oil. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, terima kasih. Salam dari Indonesia. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, thanks, Pujo.